Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. Uh, hope folks are doing well. We're in May now. You know, uh, April showers bringing May flowers or something. I don't know. That's all I got. Let's just get to the good stuff. New modules. We've got some new modules. Community contributor Nico Cha30 added a new module targeting Unraid version 6.8.0. Vulnerable targets allow authentication bypass via an insecure whitelisting mechanism in auth request.php, which this module exploits and then performs remote code execution as root by abusing the extract function used in the template.php file. Nice. And I believe we'll have a demo of this one. And keeping Metasploit framework honest regarding its own bones, community contributor Pasta Official provided an exploit module and also a fix for a command injection vulnerability within Metasploit's libnotify plugin. This module generates a specially crafted XML file, which once loaded on a vulnerable target by a coerced or enticed user via the db import command leads to command execution within the context of the user who is running MSF console. Framework versions prior to 5.0. 0.86 contain this vulnerability, and we'll have a demo of this one as well. Community contributor Sven Sin added a new module for bypassing authentication on vulnerable instances of Grafana configured for LDAP or OAuth. For versions 2 through 5.2.2 inclusive, this module can generate a working remember me cookie for a valid user, which can then be used to gain access on the target. Pretty cool. Our own WVU added two new modules targeting a vulnerable VMDIR service in the vCenter server version 6.7. The first module will dump all LDAP data from a vulnerable vCenter server target via an anonymous bind LDAP connection. And the second module will dump, L well, sorry, will bypass LDAP authentication via a logic flaw, which provides access with invalid credentials and then adds a new admin user to the vCenter server. Pretty slick. Uh, and with this module work, Will also pulled in the net LDAP gem and made it available in framework via a new mixin, which makes it easy for future framework modules that want to act as an LDAP client to just add that mixin in. Contributor Tim Wright added an improved screen share experience for a handful of interpreters, including Windows, Mac OS, and Java, allowing attackers to both see the target desktop and send mouse and keyboard events to it via a basic web browser window. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah, we'll have a demo of this as well. Community contributor L Codes provided a module targeting Apache Shiro, which is an open source software security framework. In versions prior to 1.2.5, the Remember Me cookie is insecurely treated as a Java serialized object, which this module exploits to gain unauthenticated remote code execution on the target. And rounding out our list, our own Brendan Waters added a new Privesk module targeting Docker Community Edition for Windows versions up to and including 2.1.0.0. This module takes advantage of Docker's login behavior where vulnerable versions will execute Docker credential wincred.exe in a directory which is readable, writable to low privileged users. Replacing this executable with a payload, this new module allows an attacker to trigger the privesk via the Docker login command on target's administrator command shell, creating a new session that can escalate via get system. Uh, it's pretty cool and we'll have a demo of this one as well. And we have a lot of other valuable framework going on to talk about. Uh, sorry, a lot of other valuable work in framework going on to talk about outside of modules. Uh, some enhancements and features. Community contributor Mehmet Ince updated the Python pagers, uh, payload stager generation code to remove white space from generated stagers, uh, which had an added bonus of smaller sizes and still maintained compatibility with older Python targets. Very nice work there. And we've got a few OSX enhancements. Contributor Tim Wright added a new OSX payload type, reverse TCP UID, which supports payload UUID values. Tim also updated the reverse TCP payload to send UUID values if requested. And Tim also added a few improvements to the OSX stager, including covering cases where the DILD Mako might not be loaded in the expected location and support for a interpreter debug level and its related user viewable debug output. Some nice improvements there. Uh, contributor OJ put in a good amount of work on the Windows interpreter, uh, ultimately helping reduce the complexity of extension building and loading, as well as removing some fingerprint artifacts and reducing payload size. Great stuff there. Uh, a note 
to uh, framework users here that Windows Meterpreter sessions, which are open prior to this bump, will not be able to load new extensions after the bump if they connect with a new instance of an MSF console. So caveat there. Um, also, speaking of Windows Interpreter, our own Grant Wilcox added a safeguard check to Interpreter's screenshot command for Windows targets to ensure that screenshots won't be attempted in cases where desktop restriction will prevent a successful snapshot. And in these cases, attempts to take the snapshot may crash other processes like Explorer. Uh, so I appreciate that check there. Our own Spencer McIntyre improved the .NET deserialization library by adding two new chains, uh, one called Type Fusion Delegate and the other Windows Identity, and a new formatter, Scope Formatter, and also updated the applic applicable modules to use them. Super cool. Our own Adam Galway added the Remote Data HTTP, Remote HTTP Data Service, updated the Remote HTTP Data Service to work with tags. Uh, in the same way that a local database instance does. So that's, that's good parity there. And contributor hoodie flipped the default setting of the gather proof option to be true for the SSH login scanner modules, better addressing the common use case. So I appreciate that. Uh, contributor, community contributor Colonel Smith updated MSF tidy to ensure that it matches all valid ZDI references. It's a good thing. Contributors C and Kali team added Unicode support to the MSF console search command, now allowing users to find entries containing Unicode characters. Uh, do appreciate that. Our own Alan Foster deprecated the MSF console tip command in favor of the tips command, which returns a list of all productivity tips. Alan also added a couple of new productivity tips there too. Check it out. And in an effort to keep things as reliably working as possible, our own Todd Beardsley updated the import dev key script to no longer use MIT's public key servers, which had been having issues recently, and instead use Ubuntu's. So reliability for the win. And a handful of bug fixes. Always like bug fixes. Uh, our own Spencer McIntyre fixed an issue in two handler for payloads and evasion modules where exit on session was not correctly being set allowing handler's default behavior to stay active following session creation with this fix. Contributor Tim Wright fixed a race condition in the Java interpreter's file system library. Yay. Community contributor Pasta Oficial, who we mentioned in the new modules section for providing a Metasoit module for frameworks of notify plugin bone, also provided the fix to close off this path of command injection and framework. We do appreciate that. And we had some reduction in warning messages our own Alan Foster got rid of some deprecation warnings when using reverse HTTP and HTTPS interpreter shells. And our own Dean Welsh quiesced some confusing active rective warnings that appeared alongside our update to Ruby 2.7.0. We'll be re-enabling those uh, warnings in a future PR for visibility uh, in instances where framework is being used in a development environment. So super cool, appreciate all those fixes. And we have a bonus slide. Metasploit is participating in the Google Summer of Code this year, thanks to efforts by Jeffrey Martin and Spencer McIntyre. Spencer, you want to share some details? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've participated in this program in the past, but we are very excited that we were accepted to do so again. So Jeffrey and I uh, were able to select uh, two projects that we'll each be mentoring. Uh, one will be providing a SQL uh, SQL injection library into Metasploit. So the intention there is going to be to be able to provide us with some better capabilities to more easily and consistently write exploitation modules that are going to be able to do useful things, leveraging some common SQL I techniques. Uh, the other one that I will be mentoring myself is going to be providing a different way of interacting with modules in the form of session style module interaction. So some pretty exciting projects we have. Wow, that sounds awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, that is super cool. Uh, thank you, Spencer, for that. And thank you, you and Jeffrey, for, for, for heading up this effort. I think this will be really neat. I'm glad we're involved again. And uh, just our usual, uh, if you want details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog posts at blog.rapid7.com. And uh, we do appreciate everybody who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions to the project. Thank you for that. All right, let's have some demos. Mr. Waters, are you on the line? I am, sir. He's in the ether, he's there. He's you're gonna show us some Unraid RCE? Or sure. Code execution? Awesome.
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the video here. So Unraid RCE is sort of uh, a product that uh, I, I would compare to FreeNAS, but then again, I don't understand everything about FreeNAS or Unraid RCE, so I may be, or sorry, Unraid RCE is what uh, this contributor did to it. Um, but uh, it basically allows you to create a, uh, a NAS out of a regular x86-64 uh, chipset. And this particular exploit uses uh, two CVEs. One of them is a uh, authentication bypass. And once the authentication bypass takes place, they can they leverage that to do a uh, remote code execution uh, vulnerability to get uh, actual uh, a, a session on the target. Uh, if you will forgive my terrible typing, um, Clearly, I, I spoke far too quickly, far faster than I'm typing. But uh, go ahead and uh, select the payload, get everything ready. There's really not a whole lot uh, that you have to, to check off with this. Um, And pretty quickly, as soon as we uh, launch the exploit, we get uh, our session. The most stressful part between the callback and the prompt. And here we go. And we are root. Nice. We've got the metasploit lib notify command execution. All right, let me start this up here. Sure, uh, this one was, uh, you know, we, we aren't too proud to, uh, to, to host our own exploits. Uh, we had a contributor uh, give this, uh, find this particular bug we had in libnotify. Uh, libnotify is a, uh, a library that you can go ahead and put on uh, your, uh, your machine that's running uh, MSF console and it will give pop-up warnings and tell you what's going on, uh, hence the name notify. But in this particular case, there was a, uh, there was a bug with the implementation uh, and we were actually vulnerable uh, to exploitation. If you loaded a specifically crafted uh, file, it, it's a bit of an edge case, but it, is, it was absolutely a vulnerability and we went ahead and we fixed it as soon as we could. In this particular case, uh, I've gone ahead and I've created the file, uh, scan.xml. Uh, I tried to start listening on a port I was already listening on, so the handles are already running, so we're just going to leave it running. And now I'm going to go ahead and import that XML file. And we've successfully imported it. Load libnotify. Because I forgot to load the libnotify before I imported it last time. Now when I actually import it after we load libnotify, we see I get a session. And I'm running as whatever user I'm running uh, MSF console as. Nice. And the fix went in to 5.0.86, if I recall correctly, uh, yes. for this, closing this off, yeah, cool. Screen share, improved screen share. I thought this one was a lot of fun. Um, this is one that we've had in the queue for a while as we've been trying to bring it across the line uh, from Tim. And in this particular case, it gives, uh, gives the ability to interact with uh, a remote computer's desktop. So in this particular case, I've got a session on a Windows 10 machine. Uh, it looks like 1803. Uh, and we go ahead and check out the options. Basically what this does is it spins up uh, the, uh, a, a server that lets us do screen sharing. Um, and so it gives us a, uh, a web address on the local machine. And I'll go ahead and launch Firefox. And here we have a remote uh, desktop session, basically, but not 
an RGP session uh, where we can go ahead and control uh, the remote user's desktop. Pop open Notepad. And so it'll also take <laughs> key uh, inputs. Yeah, that's like. Any questions? I had a maybe a quick one, and it's okay if if we don't know quite yet. But um, what do you know? Why it uses SPI rather than the standard API U, UI screenshot uh, command? Is it faster or something? Uh, I the it, uh, I don't know if you read through the PR itself. We we did a quick back and forth for reusing some of the existing code, mm -hmm. um, and I and this may not answer your question entirely, but we decided to go. Uh, since this was a more active approach, we didn't want to reuse all of the passive stuff from just the screen cap, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Thanks. And this will work with, with Pro too, I think, right? Because it opens up a secondary um, port and you can just connect to that if you wanted to. I would think so. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Neat. Thanks, Brendan. All right. Docker time, Docker credential win cred.exe specifically time. Shelby? Yes, I'm online. Awesome, I'll start the video. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is uh, privilege escalation for Docker community edition on Windows specifically. So the prerequisite right now is to get a session, uh, which I included in the demo. <laughs> uh, so setting the options here. So over there, yeah, I have a system running Docker uh, going ahead and checking the permissions and yep, showing that I do not have permissions yet. Um, so basically what happens is uh, that Docker uh, runs and uh, while it's performing uh, whatever actions, it searches uh, a subfolder of program data. I believe it's Docker desktop. Um, that's world readable and writable by uh, just, you know, the standard user. Um, and so uh, say you can uh, actually uh, try authentication uh, with Docker login, which is what I will do momentarily. And it will actually uh, execute a folder within Docker, Docker desktop. Um, so, so this uh, exploit basically replaces that with the payload and uh, gets you a session, which you can then elevate uh, to system. And I believe, yep, there it is. Uh, any questions? Does a user who you're initially acting as need any specific permissions or is the folder that you write to pretty much wide open to any local user? It's, yeah, so the user actually needs uh, prior permissions. So on the Windows box over there, I'm actually running uh, an administrator uh, command okay. prompt. So yeah. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Neat. Thank you, Shelby. No problem. Cool. And the, I assume it's pronounced Veeam one agent. We got a demo for remote code execution. This module is, uh, has been landed, but didn't made it into the, the following, uh, release of a framework. I didn't make it in, in Thursdays, uh, but we it sounds pretty cool. So we got a demo of it. <laughs> Spencer, you on the line? Yes, I am. Cool. All right, yeah, so this is a, an unauthenticated remote code execution within the Veeam agent. Uh, so what's interesting about this is, is a few things actually, is that we are exploiting the custom binary service that Veeam has. So it's a proprietary protocol, as I understand. And that kind of does impact our ability to be able to check the service, which is why we can see here in the check method, we can see that the service is running, but we're not really able to enumerate out like version information or anything more like that. But the root cause of the vulnerability is an insecure .NET deserialization vulnerability. So it's leveraging some of those newer changes that you had mentioned that have been 
uh, added into the framework. Uh, but it also leverages a brand new uh, command stager that uses a PowerShell on the back end. So I really wanted to call that out. That's a very nice feature that was also added uh, by Will specifically for leveraging, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this vulnerability. It's our first command stager that provides PowerShell, so it's a pretty great addition. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I think the video looped around to a second time. Yeah, I just I just played it again. Yeah. Cool. I had more to say about it than, uh, than it would take. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's super cool. Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks. Is it fairly easy to identify this this software within a um, target environment? Like is, is like MAP able to scan for it since it's using the proprietary pro protocol? Yeah, there's a specific port that it runs on. Um, uh, tw I don't remember what it is. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, it, we would need to reverse more of the binary protocol and the, the program and DLLs itself. Um, but I think uh, you can probably fingerprint it. Um, it we just re would have required more work for it. But uh the agent runs on the server and it runs on all the clients as far as I can tell, which means in a, in a, in a target environment, um, you can potentially uh, attack both the backup server and, and anything that uses it. Um, so, you know, corporate laptops and such included. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Wow. Thanks for the extra information. Thanks, Will. Hey, Pierce, could I show just one minor thing real quick? I'm sorry, I sure. should have gotten on the list, but it's, it's really, 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 really quick. Uh, I just want to show one, one just awesome thing. And this was, this was that, that pipe on the reverse stager that doesn't have any spaces in it. If you've ever wondered, like, mm -hmm. how does it actually work? How do you write Python code without any spaces since Python code is, like, inherently space-oriented, right? Uh, well, it looks like what they actually did to implement it, and come on, there we go, um, is uh, you can see here it actually imports the modules straight into sort of like a module object and calls the method straight out the modules rather than importing them into the global namespace. So um, some pretty awesome, uh, some pretty clever work there. I didn't even know you could do that in Python, but uh, it's uh, neat how it ended up working. So there you go, in case you're is curious. Is this new code works. or is this what Spencer wrote some years ago? Uh, I think this is what the latest generates. Um, so I'm not sure if it's super new, but um, it's new to me anyway. So yeah, this I thought is, this cool. This came in from Mehmet. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, no that's spaces. it. Thanks. No spaces. Thanks, Brent. And here's where we talk about attacker KB or the attacker knowledge base, hacker data at community scale, because not all ones are equal. Uh, something like that. The team has some stuff to sh showcase today, some new things. Now we'll start out with displaying topic watch watch account with uh, James. All right, so this is real simple, um, but it should be a pretty valuable tool. Um, I think last demo I showed off a new uh, ability to um, watch a topic, so that way you can get notifications whenever anything happens. Um, this is kind of a second pass on that. Um, basically what uh, this feature adds is it makes the number of watchers displayed on the topic so that way you can see how many people are interested in it and this will be a good way for others to kind of gauge interest in topics without um, you know like it, you know think of it like a star or something like that on uh, on github where you can keep getting updates for it and then this will let people uh, know maybe there's a, a topic that doesn't have a lot of assessments yet. So maybe somebody who's looking for an assessment to write will go and look for topics with um, a lot of watchers, but not a lot of assessments uh, to kind of make that an easier thing to find. Uh, we added a most watch sort on the homepage. So now you can sort by um, the, you know, so this topic has two watchers, so it's up at the top, but yeah, this is this is just my local instance. This hasn't been um, pushed live yet, but uh, yeah. So now we'll show this on the topic slug. It also shows on the search results page, um, and uh, as you can see, we have a new icon too that makes it uh, a little easier to um, identify. There was some confusion over the bell since it was the same bell we use here, so now it's a little more obvious. Um, and also added it to the sticky header, so it should show up when you're scrolling through the page. That's it. Um, well, should get it live pretty soon. I think it should uh, 
be pretty valuable in showing off like how much interest there is in a topic without necessarily having a lot of content already written for it. Ooh, I love that. That's really cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks. So gamification badges and search by relevancy demos from Mr. Gonzalez. All right. So the uh, one of the key things we want to do, right, is attract con you know, contributions to Attacker KB. And early on, we had this idea of gamification uh, from, from the UX team and the product owner. And so uh, recently, uh, the team added a couple different uh, really cool things uh, around badges. And so there are two types of badges uh, currently. There is, for example, looking at the leaderboard, uh, we're able to see trophies for first, second, and third prize. So, uh, or rather place, I don't know that we have prizes, but first, second, and third place. Um, to incent people to want to strive to be able to, you know, move up, move up the leaderboard. Uh, in addition to that, we kind of just added a couple of, of nicer presentation of um, what place you're in um, as well. Now, in addition to this sort of badge, there is a second badge um, that we're really hoping will attract more contributions, and that is uh, the number of assessments. So another view that contains the badges is uh, the profile view. And in this case, for example, Buster B uh, has a badge that has a, a blue ribbon with the number 50. And what this means is that Buster B has contributed uh, 50 or more assessments. And you can see in this particular case, he's got the, the trophy um, as well. So if we go take a look at some of the other uh, contributors, like Jerry Blanks. Um, he's got a, a number 10 badge, which means he's contributed at least 10 uh, assessments. So currently we have three categories for the number of assessments. We've got 10 or more, uh, 50 or more, and then 100 or more. So currently there, I don't believe are, uh, is anyone with more than 100. Um, currently there um, are a few with 50 or more um, assessments. And if, uh, if I recall correctly, Kate uh, was saying that there are a few right at the edge of, of contributing 10 or more assessments. So the idea there is hopefully um, that will offer them more incentive to be able to get over the line of having 10 or more assessments. All right. Um, so that's pretty much, you know, how the badges uh, are working. They're pretty, they're colorful. We appreciate um, the, the collateral from Jamie and UX. Um, and so far, hopefully, you know, it will incentivize people to make more contributions. Any questions on the badges? This is kind of a leading question, but can I see them uh, on the topic page? Oh, yeah, I was going to uh, show that. And then I thought, well, as a matter of fact, uh, you can, James. So if you go to a particular topic and uh, a particular you know, viewer is looking at the, uh, the assessments, they're also shown on uh, the topic slug. So um, I think this helps users, for example, um, you know, recognize, oh, if this person is a leader on the application, um, it's a little bit more easily seen with the number of badges and perhaps um, will draw their attention to the assessment and be able to participate by making comments and, and so forth uh, on that assessment. But yeah, thank you, James. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the next thing um, I'd like to, to demo is uh, what we're calling search uh, relevancy. So the we had kind of a basic um, regex-like search implemented when the product was, was first developed and being developed uh, and recently added um, more of a, you know, dare I say a Google style relevancy sort of search. And so the, the idea here is that if we search to, you know, for a, a term, the sort of the algorithm that's sort of in place right now um, is kind of a weighted a weighted distribution of things. And what do I mean by that? So when we talk, you know, type in a, a general term like Zoom, 
we want to make sure that we're going to weight various parts of the topic uh, that that's returned accordingly. So we would expect, for example, in the, the name or title, um, we would want to weight those topics that have the word Zoom in the title, uh, you know, once or, or, or more times. And then there is the actual content or the description of the topic itself um, to be able to, you know, say, okay, well, that term appears more times in there. And we look at several other aspects of the topic, like the number of assessments, as well as um, the content of the assessments themselves. So the word Zoom appears in here. So that's kind of your basic, you know, does the search term appear in the content of the topic? Now, I did allude to the fact that um, we're, we're trying to capture relevancy. So if, for example, there are many topics that meet the criteria where the search term appears in the content, then we want to be able to kind of push the more relevant ones up to the top. And right now, what we mean by relevant is uh, more participation. So if a topic has lots of assessments, for example, then that particular or those topics get weighted up to the top. Um, in addition to that, James just showed the topic watching. Uh, once the topic watching gets uh, introduced to the, to the production um, uh, site, then we'll also include the number of topic watchers as an added weight so that if there's a hot topic and lots of people are watching it, then that particular search uh, result will will get pushed uh, to the top. So two aspects, does the term appear in the content and then we sort of add additional weight if folks um, are watching or participating around the topic. Now when we were kind of trying to, to come up with this notion of, of what do we mean by by relevant, um, a lot of it's going to depend right on on the numbers. Um, for example, because this new feature of watching a topic um, is going to have, you know, uh, relatively few people the, who are watching topics, um, because it's a new feature, the numbers kind of are going to be a little bit skewed, perhaps. And so one thing I wanted to point out was uh, we have about a half dozen weights, you know, based on, like I said, the whether the, con the term appears in the, the topic content or whether uh, the number of assessments or topic watchers um, are all variable values that we can set um, in production um, using the, the CPS uh, system. So as things progress, we would expect those weights probably we're going to be adjusting them as the numbers level out uh, with more participation in the site. Again, with the whole notion of helping people who search for a term find what's relevant from, you know, the perhaps many topics that would normally appear in a, in a search result. Excellent.